Hey guys, welcome back. So one month ago on this channel, we did a video predicting who is going to win the 2024 presidential election. Now since then, a crazy amount has changed. We had the debate, we had the assassination attempt, we had the naming of J.D. Vance, we had President Biden dropping out, we had Kamala Harris taking over, we had the naming of Tim Walls. Whew, saying all that in one sentence is really, really hard, and I hope that that's all we have to say about the crazy amount of things that have changed. But it does seem at this point like things have somewhat stabilized. And the polls have had some time to catch up. We'll talk about whether they fully caught up or not later in this video. But this is a good time to check in again on our methodology and see, given all of these changes, what is our new prediction of who is going to win the 2024 presidential election? Kamala Harris or Donald Trump? Now, I'm not going to go through the methodology again uh, mathematically in this video. If you want to get an idea of the methodology, there's two previous videos. Most importantly, the last one we made a couple weeks ago saying how we're going to update the methodology in light of all these recent changes. But rather, in this video, I'm going to do something that was requested a lot in the comments of those two previous videos, which is walk you through the code, and then also the code will be made available for you if you want to edit it. And I'll point out those places where there's different assumptions you can make and the results will change accordingly. So without further ado, let's get to the code, and through the code, we'll make our new prediction. All right, folks, let's go through the code here, which is eventually going to lead to our prediction of the 2024 election three months out. If I happen to not answer any of your questions through this walkthrough, please do leave them in the comments section below. So the first thing we do here, because remember, our method is a Bayesian method where we use as our prior the results of the 2020 presidential election and then update that prior with the most recent polling data. So the first step there logically is going to be grabbing the results of the 2020 election. So this is just reading those results out of this text file, and I will include that text file alongside this notebook. But the output is this very simple data frame. For each state, we have the number of electoral votes that state had, we had who won that state in 2020, we have the actual voter breakdowns for Trump versus Biden, and then we have how many electoral votes were won by Trump versus Biden. So we have all that data ready for our prior. The next part is going to be grabbing the data that we need to update that prior, and that is going to be the state level polling data. Now, there's actually quite an interesting story here because of all the recent changes that have been made, especially the switch from Biden to uh, Harris as the Democratic nominee. And to illustrate that, I'm actually going to go to the source that we're using to grab this polling data, which is 538.com, which has a lot of this uh, statewide and national polling data. So take a state like Tennessee. Now, if you look down at the recent polling data, the most recent thing is Biden versus Trump. There is no Harris versus Trump poll here. And the likely reason for that is if you look at the most recent Biden versus Trump, Trump is winning by a gigantic margin. So if I'm a pollster and I'm trying to figure out where to allocate my polling resources, I'm probably not going to go waste my time polling for Trump versus Harris in Tennessee because I know based on the most recent poll and also just historically that Tennessee is very, very likely, almost guaranteed to go to Trump. And so I'm not going to conduct a Harris versus Trump poll here. Now, that makes total sense logically. But it does create a little bit of a wrinkle for us because it raises the question of, well, what am I going to use to update my prior if I don't have any polling data for Harris versus Trump? Now, we'll come back to that question in a second, but there are definitely states who have a lot, a lot of recent polling data for Harris versus Trump, especially those what are called swing states. And Wisconsin is one of those swing states. So if I go down to the most recent Biden versus Trump data, you actually see it's a dead tie. 42%, 42% for Biden versus Trump, it's just even. And so again, going back to putting yourself in the shoes of a pollster, I'm gonna spend a lot of my resources polling and polling very frequently, the state of Wisconsin and other very tied swing states, because I wanna know in a very up-to-date fashion who is going to likely win this election. So you can see after this Biden versus Trump uh, poll, there are just countless Harris versus Trump, Harris versus Trump, Harris versus Trump. Everybody wants a Harris versus Trump poll. And for good reason. You can see in the very beginning here, Trump was actually leading Harris. But in most recent polls, you can see that in some Trump is actually leading and others Harris is actually leading. And so it makes sense why we'd want to poll these very, very frequently. And actually, there's even other states where there's not even a Biden versus Trump poll. I think Delaware is an example of that, where you can see that there was like a Kennedy versus Biden poll and like a Kennedy versus Trump poll, but there was never a Biden versus Trump poll. And there's certainly not a Harris versus Trump poll here. So we have these three distinct situations and we need to figure out what we're going to do in each one in order to update our prior. And we're going to make a very, very simple assumption here. We're going to say if there is 
if there is Harris versus Trump data, like we had in Wisconsin, for example, then we're just gonna use that. We're gonna use the most recent Harris versus Trump poll to update our prior. Now, if there's not a Harris versus Trump poll, but there is a Biden versus Trump poll, like in Tennessee, we're gonna use the most recent Biden versus Trump poll to update our prior, but we're going to include more uncertainty along with that update. And the reason we include more uncertainty is, well, Biden is not running anymore. So although we are kind of using Biden as a stand-in, as a proxy for Harris, that's not gonna be perfect. And so we're gonna introduce more uncertainty than we normally would when making that update to our prior. And in the final case, as in the case of Delaware, where there's not even a Biden versus Trump poll and certainly not a Harris versus Trump poll, we're actually gonna fall back on the national presidential poll. So you can see here we have the national polls where Kamala Harris is ahead by 2.3 points. We're gonna say for any state who doesn't have any kind of polling, whether that's between uh, Harris versus Trump or Biden versus Trump, then we're just gonna fall back and assume they're gonna vote according to the national poll, which is not a great assumption. And to encode the fact that that's not a great assumption, we're going to introduce even more uncertainty, even more uncertainty when making that update to the prior for that state. So I think that's the best we can do for now. I'm sure there's other data sources we could pull in in the future to make better estimates, but I think that's a pretty good middle ground for right now. And I'm gonna show you in the code exactly how that works. And so these two functions here, get latest poll and get poll info is actually doing the scraping from that 538 polls website. And what we end up with, so you can see here that there's several states where there's no Trump-Harris polling data, but there was Trump-Biden polling data. There's yet other states where there's no data at all. So you can see all the cases being enumerated here. And the result is as we see down here. So we have pretty good coverage. We have 44 of the states covered here. So we're missing a handful. But we can see that for these 44 states, there is either a Biden-Trump poll or there is a Trump-Harris poll. So we have coverage either way for the majority of the states. Now what we do is go ahead and join those last two data sources together. We join the 2020 election data to the latest state level polling data. And once we have those joined up, we're gonna go ahead and run this simulate election function. Now this is the function that I wanna spend the most time on in this video because this is what's actually driving the methodology and where all of the assumptions that we have are baked in. So let's go ahead and go through this. I've commented it as best I can, but I'll go through it line by line here. The first thing we do up here is get all the different cases. Is this a state where we have Trump-Harris polling? Is there a state where we have Trump-Biden polling? Or is this a state where we don't have any kind of polling at all? That's gonna be important because we'll need these indices to update our priors accordingly a little bit later on. Now, this is a very, very important part of the code as well. And this is directly taken from the last video we had a couple weeks ago where we said, hey, some crazy stuff is happening in the political landscape. Biden just dropped out, Harris just entered. And so we're going to need to inject some artificial uncertainty into our method because even though we have more up-to-date polling now, as you saw, it's not for all states. And even though we can kind of use the results of the previous election to be predictive of this one, there's a big problem now because it's not the same two candidates. And so there's a lot less reason to believe that the results of 2020 are gonna be predictive of the results of 2024. We're gonna enforce that there's a baseline amount of uncertainty when it comes to predicting who's going to win in each state. And that baseline uncertainty we've set for right now is 2%. What does that mean? That means that even if the polling data and the last voting data says that our two candidates are tied 50-50 in a given state, let's say Wisconsin, I'm gonna enforce that there is a minimum 2% margin of error that comes along with that prediction. And that is just me encoding the fact that I don't know if the polling data is fully up to date yet. I don't know if we can fully trust that the results of previous election are gonna impact this one or be predictive of this one. And so we're gonna set that as 2%, but crucially, as we said in the previous video, that 2% is gonna go lower and lower and lower as we get closer to election day, where the polling data becomes more and more and more accurate. Even though it's never going to go to 0% uncertainty, we're gonna start with this relatively high amount of uncertainty and we're gonna go down from there over time. Now this is definitely a place where I wanna point out that this 2% is not some magic number that I know is correct. It is an assumption that I'm making. And so when you download this notebook, you can change that to 5% if you have even less faith in the polling data and the results of previous election being impactful of this one. You can set that to a lower number if you have more faith. So that's the pro and con here where yes, this is flexible, but also it's a little bit hard to know what it's based off of but really that's a place for you to express your belief about the world. 
And so that's what that baseline uncertainty is doing. And we're going to artificially update the number of votes for each state to give that baseline amount of uncertainty. Now these other two lines down here are giving the baseline amount of uncertainty for the case where uh, we don't have direct Harris Trump polling data, but we do have Biden Trump polling data. You can see what we're doing here is doing 1.5 times that amount of uncertainty. So as we said before, we are increasing the amount of uncertainty by 50%. And in the case where there's no polling data at all, either between Harris and Trump or Biden and Trump, we're going to double that amount of uncertainty. So these three lines are together crucially encoding and injecting that uncertainty that we have around the process, whatever that uncertainty might be, and stratifying it based on which case of polling data that we are in. Now next, we calculate the posterior alphas and betas for our posterior beta distribution. So really, I should have called this posterior alphas and posterior betas, but it is written in the comment above here. And so you can see here, and let's spend a second talking about how these posteriors are calculated. Maybe it's actually easier if I bring these down for just a moment. So you can see when we calculate the posterior alphas, which are going to be the posterior probabilities that Harris is going to win this election, we start by assigning our weight that we place on the results of the previous election being predictive of this one. Let's say that's 30%, which would mean that the weight we place on the recent polling data is one minus that, 70%. So for each one, we're saying that this is how many votes exist in the state, and this is what fraction of people are attributed to that type of weighting system. So you can see here, for the weight that we place on the results of the previous election of impacting this election, we are multiplying the number of votes in that state by the fraction of people who voted for Biden in the previous election. And for this other term, we are multiplying the number of votes in the state by the fraction of people who are polling for Harris right now. So if this is still a little bit confusing, let me tell the story in a slightly different way. Assume that there are 100 people in a state, so n, n votes is going to be 100 people. Now, weight vote being 30% means, let's say that 30% of these 100 people, or 30 people, are going to vote the way they did in the previous election. And so we're basically saying that those 30 people are going to vote at the fraction that they voted for Biden in the previous election. That's the fraction that's going to go to Harris in this election. Now the other part of that story is there's 70 other people in that state. Those 70 people, which is going to be the product of this 70% and this 100 people, are going to vote the way that they said they were going to vote in the most recent polls. So together these two are basically saying that assume the population is split between folks who are going to vote like they did last time and folks that are going to vote how they said they're going to vote in the polls, and we're going to assign those two groups of voters, combine them, sum them up, we're going to assign those to the fraction of voters that are going to vote for Kamala Harris in this state in this upcoming election. And so we do a very, very similar thing for the betas, it's just that we have Trump everywhere instead of Harris. Now we have to update these alphas and betas for the two other cases. Here we're updating it for the states where we only had Trump-Biden polling, and the only difference here really is that we're using a different number of estimated voters in the state, which is going to be lower because we have more uncertainty and the final cases where there's no polling data at all. And the only two differences here is that we're using yet a different number of expected voters in the state, which is going to be even lower because we're expecting even more uncertainty. And the other difference here is that instead of falling back on any actual statewide polling data, because there does not exist any such data, we're falling back on the national Harris poll and the national Trump poll. So that's it. We go ahead and simulate an election like that a hundred times. And we do that for all different combinations of the weight we place on polling data and the weight we place on the results of the previous election being predictive of this one. And da, 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 this is the result that we get. And this is encoding our prediction of the 2024 presidential election three months out. How do we read this thing? On the x-axis is the level of trust we place in the polling data. So on the very left side would be somebody who does not trust the polling data at all. For whatever reason, I just don't think it's trustworthy. I'm not even going to consider it. I'm going to place all of my faith in what is going to predict this election based on what happened in the last election. And if we do that, unsurprisingly, we see that Harris is the likely victor because in the last election, the Democrat, Biden, won. And so if we fully just believe that's going to happen again, then expectedly, we'd also expect that Harris is going to win in this election. Now on the other end of this spectrum is someone who places all of their trust in the polling data. I believe that the polling data is exactly accurate. I think pollsters are doing an amazing job. I think everyone is telling the truth. I think the polls are representative, all that. 
So if you fully trust the polling data, then you can see that it's a lot harder to tell what's happening. At the very end, we do see that Trump has the lead, but ever so marginally. And the thing we should point out, the elephant in the room here, is that no matter where you are on the spectrum of not trusting polling data at all to fully trusting polling data, the amount of uncertainty is crazy. And that's not unexpected, rather it's by design. We injected a certain amount of uncertainty into this process just because of how crazy the political landscape has been. If you chose to inject even more uncertainty, these bars would be even bigger. If you chose to inject less uncertainty, as we will over time, as we get closer to the election, these bars will narrow and narrow and narrow. But right now you see that unless you're at this very left side around the 0 to 0.1 range in terms of trusting polling data, which many of you might choose to be based on your own personal beliefs, in which case you would say that I'm pretty sure Harris is going to win, there's a little bit of uncertainty involved, but these bars don't really overlap, Unless you're in that range, you have to accept, if you trust all the assumptions that we've made in this video, you have to accept that maybe there's a winner on average, but the error bars overlap enough to where I can't confidently say who the winner is going to be. And that story becomes more and more and more true the more and more and more we trust polling data. For example, if I'm someone who trusts polling data at, let's say, the 70% level, then I read up here and say, you know what, if I had to give you an answer, I think Harris is going to win, but the error bars overlap so much that I can't put too much faith in that statement. So as anticlimactic as it might be, our prediction of who is going to win in the 2024 presidential election is almost certainly, I can't say for certain, but personally the amount of trust I put in polling data at this point in the process is not super high because there have been a lot of recent changes and there's a lot of changes that could still be made in the next three months even though that seems very close there's a lot that could still happen given a lot that did just happen in the previous month so if i put a level of trust around 20 percent let's say myself on polling data then i would say that i would have to say that kamala harris is going to win based on just the average lines here so if i had to give a single answer it would be something like Harris gets 290 electoral votes and Trump gets something like 250 electoral votes. But I have to tell the part of the story where there's a crazy amount of uncertainty that I have at this point as well. But it is interesting to state that because just a month ago when we made the first video in this series, I was predicting that Trump is going to win. And now we're predicting the opposite with the big caveat that there's all this uncertainty involved. So that's the method, folks. This notebook will, of course, be available to you in the description of this video. If you have any ideas or thoughts or improvements to this method, please do put them in the comments section below. And please feel free to download this notebook and make those changes yourself and share what interesting things you find. So we will be making another video in the series another month later based on how the polling data changes and based on any updates to our methodology. Thank you so much for watching, like and subscribe for more videos just like this, and I'll see all you wonderful people next time.